Hi folks, Mr. Ackerman here. Thanks for watching. This video is for the Hooks Law Lab called Testing Real Springs. I'm going to take you through the objective of the lab. I'm going to show you some data that you can use, and then I'll tell you what you need to submit. You can find information about the lab in the classwork section of G Class. You'll also find in there the video that you've seen before, which I created to help my students create lab reports on computer. You're going to need access to Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel. You might be able to get away with other graphing programs uh, and word processors, but only if they have the right symbols. We'll talk more about that later. And uh, in addition to that, if you go into the stream in G Class, you'll see where this all fits into lesson number five. Basically, when you go to the lecture notes, the first page talks a little bit about the lab, and normally we would do that in class together, <clears throat> but right now you're going to do the lab virtually, and I'll show you some real data. And uh, of course, there's the regular video, which includes the theory, but we're going to start with the lab. So let's jump to the apparatus and the objective. The idea here is to think of springs as uh, exactly what you think they are, stretchy things, also things that can be compressed. They have a lot of applications in, in real life, whether it's the suspension in your car to make the ride uh, less, uh, less harsh and a little smoother, or whether it's in a, an old watch that has um, springs to keep it going tick-tock, tick-tock. Uh, it could have some relationship <clears throat> with building materials. So, for example, uh, how do materials respond when we stress them, when we stretch them or compress them? And uh, there's even applications that involve chemistry. For example, if you think of a diatomic molecule like O2 as an example, you probably learned in chemistry class that the two oxygen atoms are vibrating, they're in motion, right? The electrical forces that are holding them together actually allow for a little bit of motion, and that can be modeled with what you're going to learn today. So let's get started. We want to find out what's the relationship between the force that you're applying to a spring and the amount by which it will stretch. And the apparatus is a little miniature retort stand like this. It's got a sliding ruler that measures in millimeters. It's got a spring. There's actually two springs that you can use. Uh, the springs that I have, one of them is kind of silver looking and it's pretty stretchy. And the other one's dark gray and it's not as stretchy. There's also a bunch of masses that can be attached to the bottom of the stand here so that we have a known mass pulling downward, exerting a force of gravity. Force of gravity equals mg, so we're going to measure the mass with the electronic balance, and that's going to help us figure out the force. Um, for your information, here's your first bit of data. The four masses, which have a little slot so that they'll fit onto this little platform here, these are the masses. These are in kilograms, and there is a little decimal place right there. So uh, if you remove the decimal place, you're seeing the mass in grams, if you prefer. All right, moving on. Let's see what I found out when I did this lab on my own. Uh, I started off by moving the ruler so that this little pointer here on the stand, which is attached to the spring, is pointing at zero. And then I added one mass two masses, and three masses. And if you go back to the previous slide, you'll see what those masses are. And so the idea is that you can just analyze what forces are acting. We have the force of gravity down, and that, of course, is equal to mg. The masses are on the previous slide, just as a reminder. And I allow this spring to come to equilibrium so that the force that the spring is pulling back up with Let's call that F spring, with these guys vector hats. F spring is going to be equal to Fg. Okay, so we're allowing those to come into equilibrium. Um, just FYI, in case you didn't know, your textbook and most people refer to the spring force as Fx. Because if you think about something stretchy like a spring, the more you pull it, the greater the distance you pull it, the harder it gets to pull, the more force it pulls back with. And so we quickly start to realize that the spring force is has something to do with x, the distance that you're stretching. So in here, you're going to measure x. That's the distance. And you can zoom in on this. 
n and see how many millimeters of stretch you get. Here I've got one mass. Here I've got two masses. Here I have three masses. And once you get to this point, uh, if you add a fourth mass, the, all the masses actually hit the base of the retort stand, so I can't do any more. I can only get you three data points here. And what you're going to do at this point is just make your observations. I'm going to say, when I add force measured in newtons, here's how much stretch I get in meters. And you're going to have three data points, which isn't a lot, but luckily for this particular lab, it's sufficient because as you're going to see, it is a very, very uh, reliable trend that gets produced. You don't need too many data points to get some, uh, to figure out the characteristics of the spring. Anyway, I'll leave you to observe that. You can do that for the silver spring, and you can also do it for the dark gray spring. Remember, the dark gray spring is not as stretchy, so I can actually go one, one and two, one, two, three, one, two, three, and four uh, masses before, if I had a fifth one, I hit the, the bottom again, okay? So when you're collecting data and preparing to hand in, I want you to do the dark gray spring or the silver spring. You don't have to hand in both, but I think you should measure both anyway and go through the calculations just to see the difference between a stretchy spring and a not so stretchy spring. Okay, but what you're handing in, you choose this or that for hand in. And I'll tell you what is required in hand in in just a bit. Before we do that, you need to know that I'm looking for something a little more than just some basic measurements and uh, calculations. I want you to think about uncertainties. If you think back to uncertainties, we learned in Unit 1 that there were instrumental errors and there were statistical errors. Uh, instrumental errors, remember there's that half the smallest measurement idea. So here we're going to be using um, the electronic balance to measure the mass and then the force. And we're also going to be using a ruler to find the displacement. So think about what the instrumental error would be by looking at the pictures on the previous slides. In terms of, so that's this one. In terms of the statistical error, I want you to think carefully about this. We encountered statistical error when we made measurements like uh, reaction time, you know, maybe timing the ball that was moving in the ball bearing bounce. And uh, back then there were a lot of different people timing, and they had to think about their reaction time and so on. It led to a spread in the numbers that even the same person measuring the same thing over and over could produce. Uh, is that such an issue here? Think about it carefully. Are we in a statistical error environment here where there's a lot of variation from one measurement to the next? Or do you think it's more instrumental error? Well, you do the thinking and make the decisions. You can talk to each other and bounce some ideas off of one another, and you can message me as well. You can post some comments in the, uh, in the class comments section of G Class so everyone can see it. Or you can make them private comments and I'll respond to you. But getting into this, let's see. We're going to measure mass, and we're going to have the, the force equaling m times g. Now, you're going to decide what to do here in terms of your error. I don't know, maybe you'll have, for the, for the 50 gram mass, you have 0 0.050 kilograms, plus or minus something, which it's up to you to decide what that's going to be. Then you're going to multiply that by 9.8 newtons per kilogram, and that should have plus or minus something. Now, we've never really talked too much about what the uncertainty is for G, and that's because it's not an easy question to answer. If you think about it, you learn in grade 11 that G varies across the surface of the Earth. It can change from one place to another. So if I give you the uncertainty in Toronto, that might not be the same range of possible values as in some other city. So what are we going to do here? Well, I'm going to think back to grade 11 where we measured acceleration due to gravity and I'm going to tell you guys that in my experience teaching physics usually students are able to get within about 5% of the true value. This is over many many years of watching students do this lab. So let's make things simple and let's do this. I'm going to give you 5% 
as the uncertainty for G, so that you don't have to go look it up, you don't have to go measure it yourself, you don't have to worry about this. Just use this. Okay? But what are you going to use for this? That's up to you. You've got to think about it. And remember, in Unit 1, when we learned how to deal with uncertainties, we learned that when you multiply uncertainties, uh, sorry, when you multiply values like mass and, and uh, gravitational fields, you add the percent uncertainty, okay? So now you'll know what to do to get the uncertainty for each of your force measurements. Now, how about the displacement? Well, you're going to look at that ruler there in the previous images that showed the amount of stretch, and that's going to help you find your instrument error. You're going to make a decision about the statistical error. There's no multipl multiplying to do, so whatever number you decide on, that's it. And so I'm going to say that this one's pretty easy to figure out. Okay? If you have trouble, again, you can message each other or you can message me. What do I want you to do with that? Well, I'm going to ask you to do two things in this lab. One is to present a data table, and the other is to present a graph. But when you make your graph, you're going to have to express the uncertainties. Now let me show you what that's going to look like. Suppose, let me just move myself up here for a moment, Suppose you're making a graph of the amount of force and the amount of stretch that you get. And let's just say, for argument's sake, you have something like, um, let's say, force equals 2.0 newtons plus or minus 0.3 of a newton. And let's say that the related amount of stretch is x equals, let's call it, 0 0.20 meters plus or minus 0.3. 0, 0.05 of a meter. Now, you know that this and that help you find the dot on the plot, which would be right around there, 2 newtons, 0.2 meters. But how do you show this part, the plus or minus 0.3? Well, if you guessed that this is telling you anywhere from 1.7 newtons to 2.3 newtons, that's what this means, then that means the number could be as high as 2.3 or as low as 1.7. And if you kind of take that across to here, it means you've actually got a range of possible values in there. And this is what we call an error bar. This would be the vertical error bar in the y direction. Now, if you do the same thing for the x direction, or the x value, then we have uh, 0 0.20 minus 0 0.05. That's from 0.15 meters to 0.25 meters. And so that means we're anywhere from here to here. And so we go up there and we put a little line. We go up here and we put a little line. And then we go across there. And so there's your horizontal or x error bar. And now what you've done is you've kind of mapped out a region on this graph in which the true data point may lie. And if you have a bunch of different points, you know, maybe you've got one down here which has an error bar, and you've got another one up here that has an error bar, and you think about the rectangles in which the true value lies, you now have a little bit of leeway in terms of how you draw your line of best fit. Like really, any line of best fit that goes through all the error bars would be great. You could say that that's a potential line. And if you are a researcher who's trying to say, hey, what's the trend line here? In this case, let's pretend it's a straight line. You need to know the slope and you need to know the y-intercept. Whatever you're studying, now you can give a range of possible values based on these uncertainties. So that's kind of where that's heading. Now we're not actually graphing uh, with, with all these complicated lines of best fit. What I want you to do in the graph is to show the actual error bars for each of your data points. And I'm going to show you how to do that in Excel. And I'm also going to show you how to report that in your data table using Microsoft Word. So let's finish off by just taking a look at the rubric. So 
In your course pack on page four, you're going to find a rubric. I want you to hand in only the following things. A data table with all of the things that you see in here. And a graph with all of the things that you see in here. There's a rubric, five marks for communication for the data table, and another five marks communication for the graph. If you're wondering, how do I do this? What is this guy talking about? Don't worry. This video, how to produce a lab report on a computer, has instructions for making data tables in Word and graphs in Excel with error bars. It's going to show you how to do all that. So once again, go into the classwork setting, click on Lab, Hooks Law. There's the video right there for you. The submission instructions are pretty much the same as always. You're going to make me a PDF and attach it. And that's it. Remember, this is the beginning of the lecture notes for the entire lesson. So we're going to get the lab done first, and then after that, we're going to dive into the theory, and we're going to learn about elastic potential energy and something called simple harmonic motion. All of that comes later. All right, guys, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, you know where to get hold of me. Email is fine. Uh, private message in G class is fine. Or better yet, if you think it's something that might benefit everyone else, post a public comment in the assignment so that everyone can see your question and they can see my answer too. Hope you're all doing well. Stay safe. Bye for now.